Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. During the final three years of World War II, roughly 3,000 high-value Nazi detainees were brought to a top-secret military facility established near D.C. along the Potomac River, just north of Mount Vernon. There, they were interrogated by American servicemen who had been specially recruited for the task, and including many Jews who had fled Nazi Germany as children. In this episode, meet Robert Sutton, former chief historian of the National Park Service and author of Nazis on the Potomac. He tells the story of the work done at Fort Hunt, Virginia, codenamed P.O. Box 1142, and the importance it had on the war effort. Robert Sutton, you have a new book out titled Nazis on the Potomac. What's the basic story you're telling? Well, this is a, this is a story that could have very well just disappeared um, in, during World War II um, in Fort Hunt, which is, a, uh, most people consider Fort Hunt a picnic park. Uh, it's about halfway between Alexandria and Mount Vernon on the George Washington Parkway. But during World War II, it became the site of three programs that were top secret, that were so top secret that the, the people who were involved in the program were sworn to secrecy uh, and assumed that they would carry the story with them to the grave, and most of them unfortunately did. But um, in the about 2000, um, as the, many of the, of the different programs from World War II were declassified, it became clear that something really interesting had happened there. Uh, there was a, one program called MISY that was that, where they brought the high, very high level or or high value um, German prisoners in, um, either from U-boats or from the field, to to interrogate and to listen into their conversations. Another program, MIRS, which was Mili- Military Intelligence Resource Service Research um, Section, doc- uh, translated and evaluated tons, of, literally tons of German documents and wrote very important reports, reports about it. And the third program, um, Military Intelligence Resor- Research Series X, was Escape and Evasion. And what they did there was they, they put together packages for pilots, so if they were shot down, they would have a means to hopefully evade capture. Or if they were in POW camps, they set up a very elaborate and very sophisticated and very successful program where they would communicate through cryptographic letters with prisoners, and they would say that something, a package is coming, um, and it would come from a dummy um, corporation, organization, and it might have something like a, a transmitter in a in the tr- cribbage board or transmitter in a baseball or maps in uh, playing cards that p- take the playing cards apart and you have a map. So these were the three programs at Fort Hunt during World War II. And then after World War II, there was another program that was very, very different called Operation Paperclip. And what this did was that during the Cold War, Americans wanted to recruit, recruit the highest level and the highest um, functioning in engineering and so forth Germans from World War II to help them plan for dealing with the Cold War. So that's what happened to Fort Hunt. So what were the exact years that Fort Hunt was used in this capacity? It was used from 1942 to 1946. How many Nazis were brought through this site overall? Over 3,000. And if you had to say in the biggest sense, because the subtitle of your book really declares this, that they helped the war effort significantly, what was the major contribution of the work done at Fort Hunt? Well, I would say it was cumulative. So they got little bits and pieces from some of the uh, soldiers and sailors that they interrogated or listened to their conversations. So they did get some important information, such as uh, they, bombers were uh, allied bombers late in the war were bombing, successfully bombing, railroad terminals. But they had noticed the next day that the trains were running as if nothing had happened. Well, they found out that they were loading and unloading trains at the, at the crossings. Um, and so this was uh, something that they found that was very important. So they started bombing the crossings, and that was successful. Um, the other thing was the, they, uh, the, the publications that came out of the MIRS, Military Intelligence Research Section, 
were incredibly valuable. The most valuable of these was what was called the Red Book, or the Order of Battle of the German Army. And what this did was it documented every division in the German army, who the commander was, where they were, where they had been, and so forth. It went into great detail about the, um, about the uh, SS, the Gestapo, the SS, the different branches, what they did, who were the lethal ones, who were not. And so for things like D-Day, when, when D-Day was, when they were preparing for D-Day, this book was invaluable because it told all of the different milita- German uh, forces that were in Belgium and France at the time, where they were, what their strength was, and so forth. So uh, that was incredibly valuable as well. And then they, they uncovered some things like uh, what was going on after, after the uh, assassination attempt on Hitler. The whole thing changed so that they began to focus more on um, whether people were loyal to Hitler rather than worrying about winning the war. They were still interested in winning the war. But um, So if you add what happened at Fort Hunt, and I could go on for a number of other things, but when you add together what happened there and what happened with other intelligence gathering operations, um, the Allies really were, were, pretty, were incredibly well prepared by the end of the war. And there are some scholars that say that the war probably ended two years before it would have otherwise with intelligence. And one scholar said that by the end of the war, Eisenhower probably knew more about what was going on with the German forces than Hitler did. So when you add what happened there with other intelligence gathering operations, it was really a pretty impressive operation. In addition to being an, an interesting historical narrative, do you think the story has lessons for us today? It does, and the main thing that came through, either from my discussions with, um, with soldiers who were stationed there or from the oral history program that we did with the National Park Service where we interviewed about 65 of the soldiers that were there, plus a reunion that took place in 2007, one thing that they wanted to make very, 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 very clear, and I have it several places in the book, was that they did not torture anybody. They never, ever resorted to corporal punishment. They had ways of getting information short of that, but they wanted to make it very, very clear. And of course, this was you know, late 2000s, around 2006, 2007. It was pretty clear what was going on in Iraq with torturing prisoners. And they wanted to make it very clear that they got more information um, by treating them well, treating prisoners well, than they could have ever gotten by torturing them. So I think that in my mind, that probably is the most important lesson that comes from this story. So more about Fort Hunt. You explained where it was physically, a couple miles north of Mount Vernon. It's got a really long history in it addition does. to this. Would you tell me a little bit of what's important about what it did in earlier lives? Yes, it was actually, it was actually part of George Washington's river plantation. And uh, he, you know, everything that he did on his plantations was very, very well documented. And in fact, shortly before he, before he died, he actually wrote sort of a plan for all of his plantations, and he specifically talked about uh, river plantation, how many slaves there were on this plantation, what he intended to do, the crops he planned to raise, the animals he planned to have there, um, whether he was going to have crops for food, for forage, for animals, for um, Stabilizing the banks and so forth. So it was, it was part of the river plantation. It fell into it fell into pretty serious disuse after he died. But then, around turn of the century, uh, around 1900, a little bit before, a little bit after, um, the the mili- the uh, American um, Congress and President recognized that America's coastal defenses were in a deplorable condition, and so they came up with what was called the Endicott Plan, which was named for the Secretary of War, Endicott, uh, to, re, to, to either beef up or build new coastal defense systems um, throughout the, the uh, coastal areas and, and harbor entrances throughout the United States. And they, they rebuilt, they, they re-fortified Fort Washington across the river in Maryland and built a new fort, Fort Hunt, um, on the Potomac, uh, and this was part of this Endicott period. And the thing that's, that is fascinating about this period and about this, this program uh, 
was that they built these humongous concrete gun batteries. And, of course, the purpose was to protect uh, against um, naval attacks. But, ironically, one of, the, one of the little things that I had in my book that I think is really fascinating is the last battery at Fort Hunt was completed in January of 2004. And a month earlier, the Wright brothers flew their flyer. And so about a month before <laughs> this last one was built, these Endicott batteries, these Endicott forts, became obsolete because they had no way of protecting against, against air attacks. You said 2004. You meant 1904. Sorry, nine, nine, 1904. 1904, <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. If you uh, visit Fort Hunt today, it is off the George Washington Memorial Parkway, heavily traveled, and it is uh, completely surrounded by suburban neighborhoods. What was it like in the 1940s? Well, there were, there were some houses around. Um, you know, some of the people that lived nearby um, talked about, um, you know, they, they sort of saw what was happening at Fort Hunt, and there were some reports... Uh, from the locals of what happened, but it was pretty much isolated, and that was for for a good reason because it was such a top secret operation. It was it was isolated. There were a lot of buildings that were there um, from both from the early period, the early Endicott period, and that were new buildings built um, during World War II. One thing that fascinated me about this period was how fast people could build things. So. They needed to have an enclosure for the prisoners that were being brought in. And so they, they asked one of the engineers uh, in the military to build a new enclosure system that would be a, you know, fortifications, offices, interrogation rooms, the whole thing. He said you, they said, you have eight weeks to build this. He actually built it in six weeks. Absolutely incredible. So um, there were new, new buildings that were built there, but um, there were still quite a few from the earlier period. During the time period, and this goes to your point about uh, not using coercion, you describe a, a very congenial setting. In addition to the, the housing, there were actually open fields and, and places of leisure for the prisoners. What was the thinking? The thinking was that if you have them comfortable, they're more likely to talk. And it, and it, worked, it worked pretty well. Um, they would have a, a recreation room with ping pong pool, that sort of thing. They would have outdoor activities. And one thing that the Germans were really liked, but they didn't know anything about before, was uh, horseshoes. Um, so they had horseshoes, they had soccer, they could essentially do anything they wanted to. And then if um, they, would, they would treat them well, they would you know, feed them well. Um, if they wanted, a lot of times, a lot of the interviews, you, you read the transcript in the interview and they, about two words into it, they say, would you like a cigarette? Are you comfortable? Are we treating you well? So forth. So they, they tried to do everything they could to treat them well. And then if a prisoner was particularly helpful, um, they, would, uh, they would take them to a nice dinner in Washington, D.C., one, one of the fancy restaurants in Washington, D.C. Uh, they might take them to a movie and so forth. So they, they generally treated them fairly well. And the thought was, if you treat them well, they will tell you, they will give you information that you need. So they were taking prisoners into Washington, D.C., Nazi prisoners into Washington, D.C., or to the movies. Did anyone ever escape? Um, there was one attempted escape, and this was a, uh, a U-boat um, captain by the name of Werner Henke. And he, Henke, and he, um, he was captured, his... Uh, U-boat was, was sunk. He was captured along with his crew. Um, he had been very successful. Uh, he had sunk, I don't know how many, I can't remember off the top of my head how many tons of shipping. Most of the ships that he had sunk were, uh, were, were British. He was terrified that he was going to be sent to Great Britain as a, as a war criminal and be, and be executed. Uh, he was so afraid of this that he actually probably... Uh, probably committed suicide by running out to the fence, trying to scale the fence. He was shot and killed. So he was the one prisoner who tried to escape, but we think he really wasn't, he really didn't think he would be able to escape. He essentially committed suicide by trying to escape. If you visited uh, Fort Hunt today, would you see any evidence of this period of time? You would see, no. Uh, no. <laughs> there, are a couple of, there are a couple of partial foundations that are sort of scattered in the woods, you really have to look to find them. 
Um, but mostly what you would see are the, the um, gun emplacements from around 1900. Uh, there's one uh, non-commissioned officer's house that was there from the early period. And that's pretty much it. Um, there's a, also there's a monument and a flagpole um, to to this to this uh, program. When was that installed? That was installed in 2007. W- uh, during the war, during this period, it wasn't referred to by the military as Fort Hunt. It had a code name. Uh, why and what was it? The code name was PO Box 1142, and the reason was they didn't want to have any association. They didn't want to have anything that would refer to Fort Hunt at all. And so this was, a, this was the post office box in Alexandria where the mail was delivered. You have retired as the chief historian for the National Park Service, and the Park Service has an important role to play in this story. So tell me about how that all came about. Well, in, uh, in about 2000, well, let me back up a little bit, pre-Park pre, uh, Service uh, participation in this program. In about 1990, a soldier who was stationed at Fort Hunt um, by the name of um, Lloyd Schumacher, wrote a book called The Escape Factory in which he talked about this program, uh, military intelligence um, re- um, military inter- intelligence section dash X uh, that was at Fort Hunt. Now the military, the army didn't, had declassified it at that time and so he wrote this book, he published it, the Army found out about it. They tried to buy up as many copies as they could. So now getting an original copy is a very, very, very rare book. Anyway, so the, the Park Service knew about this story. And then about 2000, they had a study done of Fort Hunt. And many of the documents, um, such as the um, interrogations, uh, the transcripts of interrogations, were now declassified. So they began to sort of piece together Uh, what was happening at Fort Hunt. And they really didn't know anything very much before this time about that. But in 2005, one of the rangers at Fort Hunt was giving a tour. They would do this periodically, give a tour of the military history of Fort Hunt. Her name was Dana Dirks. She was giving a tour, and she'd go through the whole thing, you know, the early history, so forth and so on. But she um, would always ask, and the rangers would always ask, they would say, if anybody knows anybody who was stationed here who is still alive, we would really, really like to speak to them. And one of the, one of the uh, visitors who was on the tour spoke up and said, I had a neighbor who was here, and he since has moved from here to um, Lexington, um, Kentucky, but he was here, and he didn't say very much about it, but we know that he was here during World War II, and you might want to contact him. Here's your, the contact information. So the Park Service contacted this man. His name was Fred Michel. And the, the person who contacted him, Brandon, Brandon Bice, um, was not having much luck trying to set up an interview with him. And he sort of th- he thought maybe the reason was because Mr. Michel was sworn to secrecy, He didn't know that he could talk about it, but finally he arranged to go meet with him. He took along in his briefcase several of the interrogations that he had conducted with his name on them, showed them to him, and he opened up and started talking about what he had done in the program at Port Hunt. Then he gave him several names, the people that he he remembered who were there, and so with that and with uh, going through the roster and just Internet trying to track people down through Google and so forth, they were able to track down about 65 uh, people who were stationed at Fort Hunt and conducted oral history interviews with as many as they could from about 2006 through 2010. Now, there were some interesting uh, interviews. There were some who were bedridden, who literally died within weeks of, uh, of the interviews. And at the time, World War II veterans were dying at a rate of about one every 90 seconds, and so really time was of the essence. Um, One of the soldiers that they intended to interview, they were ready to get on the plane to go uh, visit him in Cleveland. The family called and said that he had fallen into a coma, and they might as well just not worry about coming. Uh, Several days later, he came out of the coma. He looked around. He said, where's the Park Service? And So they called and said, well, you know, he came out of the coma. If you want to come and interview him, he'd love to talk to you. And they did and uh, went to see him. And, of course, he he passed not long after that, too. So that was one of the one of the challenges was trying to trying to uh, not only track people down, but trying to get to them before uh, before they passed. And the the amount of information 
gained from these interviews is just absolutely amazing. And there's some, one of the, one of the people that we interviewed, um, uh, Paul Fairbrook uh, in California, um, he said, why haven't you contacted John Kluge? Now, John Kluge was at Fort Hunt. He became very well known later as the, as the owner of Metro Media and at one point was the richest man, and considered the richest man in the United States. But he was at Fort Hunt, and they said, well, you know, we, we've tried, but we can't get in touch with him. And so Paul Fairbrook picked up the phone and said, hey, John, I have Park Service here, and they'd like to talk to you. And that was uh, another, another uh, entree into doing an interview. All of these oral histories are on Fort Hunt's National Park Service website. Um, in addition to this book, which they provided a lot of your research for, how have they been used since they've been done? Well, uh, they've been used for interpretation uh, at the park. Um, they have, it's mostly been, they've mostly been put up to, for research. Um, there's, 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 but was some talk at some point. Um, unfortunately, I'm not in the Park Service anymore, so I don't know what the current discussions are. But the, um, there's one building that is there um, from the early period, from the 1900 period, uh, a Nas- uh, NCO, uh, non-commissioned officers' quarters, right near the entrance. And there has been some talk of making a museum or a research center out of that building. Um, as far as I know, that has not gone too far beyond the conversation um, stage. But that, I think, would be a perfect use a perfect use for the building, number one, and a, and a wonderful place for people to um, look at these interviews. Now, the wonderful thing is most of the interviews are, are, have a transcript, have a, uh, you can listen to the interview or you can watch it on video. Most of them are actually videotaped. And so it's a, it's, they're wonderful as a research tool. I would imagine that the Pentagon's historians would be interested in, in additional information about World War II that could be learned from them. Do you work with, uh, did you work with the Pentagon in doing this project? I did not. I did not work with the Pentagon. Uh, one of the challenges of doing, I did most of this um, during COVID. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking about the interviews themselves, the oral histories. Oh, you know, I, I actually was not very involved in actually actually conducting the interviews. Um, the, the people who were involved um, were at the park. They had already, they already had the whole system set up. What I was able to do was to get them some money so they could travel to places like California uh, to conduct the interviews, but I personally was not involved in, in conducting the interviews. Did uh, Brandon Bees tell you how what the reactions were of these men talking after so many years? Uh, were they reluctant or were they happy to finally be able to tell their stories? It really varied. <laughs> some were some were very very reluctant. Most of them, once he now sometimes what he would do is what he did with Fred Michelle, which was to find a, a transcript of an interview, take it along with him, and most of them it was like it was like opening a floodgate. <laughs> they just were very very anxious to talk about what they had done. Uh, now that they knew that they could, uh, they couldn't during the war. In fact, um, there's one there's one joke. One fellow said that um, his wife kept pestering him about what he was doing during the war and he said what he was doing was making brassieres for the women's uh, for the wax the women's air um, artillery corps um, anyway he so they they were very cagey even with their families about what they were doing so when they had an opportunity to open up most of them were anxious to some of them weren't by and large, these interrogators, and we need to spend uh, some real time on them, were a very special group of soldiers. Uh, and they all had a particular heritage that they shared that you write about. Tell me about that. Well, you know, the, first of all, they were, the, the uh, Army was bringing, Army and Navy were bringing in Germans, right? And so it would be very helpful if they could find somebody who spoke German. And it'd even be more helpful if they could find a native German who spoke not only spoke German as a native tongue, but understood the nuances of the language and the culture and so forth. And it would even be more impressive if they could use Jewish German and uh, and Austrian um, soldiers. So what what the army started doing? Uh, there were there were quite a few who had come to the United States mostly during the 1930s. Um, as children, and they came in different ways. Some came through um, with their families. Some came through a program in which uh, the government allowed a thousand 
German Jewish children to come to the United States without their parents if they had either a, a foster family willing to sponsor them or uh, relatives in the United States. Uh, now, the parents were willing to do this because they thought Hitler was an aberration that eventually he'd be voted out of office because he, he was so radical. Uh, of course, they were wrong, and it was a tragedy for them because uh, the children came, but, but the parents were not allowed to do so. Um, anyway, so there are different stories. Um, there, is, there is one, one of my favorites, a fellow by the name of George Whitinger, um, went to school one day, and he was told that he could no longer attend school. He lived in Austria. He was told he could no longer attend school. Um, he said, why is that? He said, because you're Jewish. Well, those were two shocks, because number one, he couldn't attend school, but number two, he had no idea that his parents had converted from Judaism to Christianity years earlier. Uh, and so he was not, he didn't know, he didn't even know that his family had been Jewish, and so this was a double shock to him. Um, there were, uh, Paul Fairbrook um, was about 10 years old. Things were going badly in Germany. His father actually was a very, pretty wealthy, successful banker, and he decided that he didn't like what was happening in Germany, took the family to um, Palestine, later to the Netherlands, and then eventually to the United States. Um, all, many of these have stories that if you, if you would read the stories, you would think this is a novel, but it really can't be a novel because it's too outlandish to even be a novel. So some of the stories of their escapes were just amazing. Uh, some of them were fairly, fairly straightforward. Some, you know, they were able to get visas. They were able to travel um, to the United States, immigrate to the United States. But most of them came here, and the Army, of course, recognized the value of their, not only their language, but their incentive for uh, interrogating these prisoners. And it was, their, their reactions to the, to the interrogation process was, was fascinating. They would say, you know, um, I realized, many of them would say, I realized that, that these, the people I was interrogating, they weren't really bad people. They just were doing what they were required to do as soldiers. And he said, on the other hand, if, uh, you know, if I was facing them in the battlefield, they would be trying to kill me and I'd be trying to kill them. So uh, they had very interesting reactions. And, of course, most of them that had families that were still in Europe had lost contact with their families. They didn't really know what was happening. Uh, later in the war, of course, they knew about the, the terrible uh, conditions of the Holocaust. But... Uh, this was, I think, one of the most fascinating parts of this story, um, the, the Jewish men who were there. And early on, early on in the war, um, Paul Fairbrook was one of the first ones to find this out. Um, he went down to the, as soon as the, as the war started, um, after Pearl Harbor, he went to the, to the uh, Marine recruiting office and asked if he could join. He said, no, you can't join. And he couldn't join any branch of the service because he was classified as an enemy alien since he was a German citizen at that time. And many of them were in that, were in that um, classification. The Army was able to allow them to come in um, eventually, in part because Germany had declared that all uh, Jewish citizens were no longer um, were no longer citizens, and so they uh, came in and became American citizens. So it's a, it's a fascinating story. Well, let's listen to a very short clip of Paul Fairbrook telling that story in his own words. I think I read in, in your autobiography that you tried to enlist. I did. They kept refusing you. Yeah, I was I was called an enemy alien. Anyone anyone who's German Jewish in America at the time was turned down by the services because. I have a letter actually saying saying that, and so, but then they drafted. This was before, this was uh, at the end of 1944. Uh, uh, I was drafted in January 1943, so it wasn't very long after Pearl Harbor that they finally decided we better take those guys. They realized with your German language skills that you were valuable. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Robert Sutton, you, he mentioned uh, Pearl Harbor, and you write in, the, in your book how a pivotal Pearl Harbor was for these interrogators in making this decisions to join the cause. Can you talk about that? Yes. <laughs> you know, there was, there was a, um, there's a wonderful collection at the Library of Congress uh, done by uh, the, the, li the Folklore Center at the Library of Congress have been recording um, songs uh, uh, 
folk songs or local songs during the Depression. And the fellow who in charge of this, uh, Neil Lomax, not Neil Lomax, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember his first name. Anyway, he, he sent out a telegram to everybody asking them to go get to go talk to people on the street, get their get their impressions of, of Pearl Harbor, and it's very interesting. They, they're different things. Some people are afraid they're going to be drafted. Some women are afraid their husbands are going to be drafted. Most people are surprised what happened, but not shocked. But the reaction of almost all the people that I've talked to and that we talked to um, that were at Fort Hunt, that were Jewish from Europe, they were absolutely thrilled. They thought this was the greatest thing ever, that finally, finally, the United States, their new country, was going to do what it could to get even with Hitler. And most of them were perfectly fine with um, joining. Uh, Most of them that joined were were fine with that. Some were drafted, um, and they were fine with that. But most of them were were really, really very happy that finally the United States was entering entering the war against this, this person who had made their lives so miserable. Successful interrogation is a learned skill. Uh, these uh, men learned their tr- or got their training at Fort Ritchie. Where is Fort Ritchie, and why was the training so rigorous that you report that 40% of those there washed out of the program? Well, uh, Camp Ritchie is actually near present-day um, Camp David in C- the Catoctin Mountains of Maryland. Um, it's actually not far from, from Gettysburg either. Uh, Camp Ritchie had been a, um, it had been a uh, Maryland National Guard facility. It was established as a training facility for, intel- for intelligence, and it was, it, it was it, probably if you went there at the time, you'd wonder what, it, what, you'd, what you'd come into, because everywhere you looked, there were German soldiers, German tanks, German uh, half-tracks, everything looked like Germany. Um, because the training, they wanted to make it as realistic for people as possible. Most of the people that came out of uh, Camp Ritchie went to Europe, and so that was the purpose for that. But as far as interrogations, they would have um, German-Americans dressed in, in German uniforms serve as the, as the subjects for conducting interrogations, and many of them would do everything they could to try to trick the interrogator. So um, they would, you know, they would say, what's your name, what's your rank, what's your... I don't want to give you my name, I don't want to tell you anything, blah, blah, blah. So they would, they would do everything they could to try to trick the interrogators. Um, but, they were, but the interrogation training also gave them different tricks to try to uh, soften up the, the, uh, the, the Germans. And if they succeeded, by the time that they left uh, Camp Ritchie, they usually were very, very good at what they were doing, but some, of course, were not, and some of them had trouble. But uh, the training, that was part of the training. Um, there also was training, they, would, they actually had German, a recreated German village. Uh, this is what it looks like. They would have German artillery. This is what it sounds like, as opposed to American artillery and so forth. But for the Americans the, um, <coughs> that were at at Fort Hunt, the training mostly was either in interrogation or in, in research, in the, in the research section. How did the U.S. War Department learn the craft of interrogation? Well, um, what they did, um, before World War II, this is, this is a, a, an interesting part of the story. They, in, in 1941, the military, the U.S. military, the War Department, recognized that the intelligence gathering operation that was then in place was was woefully inadequate. And they sent a team over to the UK in June of 1941 to study everything that the Brits were doing for intelligence gathering, which was actually a very smart move because they'd been involved in, in the war for several years. They'd already learned a lot of things that were working, a lot of things that weren't working. And so what they did was they, they came back and said, we need to set up for, for the interrogation side, for the um, MISY program, we need to have two components to it. One, we need to interrogate prisoners. And the other thing that's very important, we need to set up a system so that we can listen in to all their conversations, either in their rooms, um, around the fort, and so forth. And so they set up 
part of the part of the program there was had they had hidden microphones all over the fort, and they would have uh, they would they would try to pick up conversations. Uh, they had a whole monitoring system. Um, there'd be usually about twelve soldiers on each day, monitoring conversations around the port. And uh, if there's something sounded like it was, it might have uh, be useful. They had a recording system. It looked actually it wasn't a tape recorder. They didn't have tape recorders then. It was like a looked like a record player. Uh, they would record the conversation, then make a transcript of it. So uh, they learned all of this from the Brits. Um, now there was some hesitation about doing the the eavesdropping part of the of the intelligence gathering. Um, some felt that it was unethical to do that. They really hadn't done that before. They really hadn't listened in on conversations. Uh, the military hadn't done that before. So there was some controversy with that, but they decided this was a good program, this is what they should do. We've talked about Fred Michelle, who was the first person the Park Service historians interviewed. We have a clip from his oral history, and what he's talking about in this is right after leaving Camp Ritchie and being brought to Fort Hunt for the first time. We'll listen. When we were shipped out of Ritchie, everybody expected to go to Europe, but we were pulled out about 20 or so people and were loaded on a bus, and nobody knew where we were going to go. Suddenly, we pulled off the parkway into a wooded area, which uh, was surrounded by barbed wire, and there was a guard at the gate, and we were going into this unknown area. We were briefed on what the nature of the installation was, and that we were, uh, and that the installation was known as P.O. Box 1142, and that we were not to, under any circumstances, tell anybody where we were. That's Fred Michel on his first sighting of uh, Fort Hunt during World War II. Did the interrogators live on site with the prisoners? Mostly they did. However, there were some who um, came there with, uh, they were married, and they were allowed to live off site um, with their spouses, um, but most lived on site. And most of them were single. How long did most of the prisoners that came through Fort Hunt uh, stay there? Uh, it really, really varied. There were some that were just there for a few days and gone. Uh, and it was, uh, some of the interrogators um, were really quite, became quite skilled at telling within just a few minutes whether there would be value in their, um, in what they said or not. Uh, so they'd be there and, and leave after a short time. Later in the war and after the war in the Operation Paperclip um, program, some would be there for weeks or months uh, that was unusual, but most of them were there for a week, couple of weeks, um, you know, fairly limited period of time. Most of them were there, and what was really important, the classification, uh, it was not considered a POW camp because there were certain restrictions on uh, what you could do with prisoners. It was considered very temporary, and generally the people who were there were transferred from, um, from uh, Fort Hunt to a POW camp somewhere in the country. Who were the most notable names among the Germans who came through? Well, there were some, there were some um, German scientists. Uh, there were some German generals. Uh, one of the generals that came through, um, uh, Reinhard Galen, um, had been a, he had been one of the, he, he was, a, he was a, a brigadier general, but his main job during World War II was uh, he was in charge of uh, uh, prisoners in in Russia, and so he knew quite a bit about Russia. So he became very valuable for um, during the Cold War. He was very ruthless. I mean, his he he and his team held no punches in what when they were dealing with the Russians. And so there was part of the problem was that the Americans uh, wanted his expertise, but he. Um, he had been a, a pretty nasty person during World War II, along with his with his people. But they they said, "Okay, fine, but but we need you anyway." Um, another another person who had been uh, connected with the Russian embassy was Gustav Hilger, 
and he was there. Uh, he was there for quite a long time. He had been the ambassador to uh, Russia. He was actually raised in Russia. He probably knew more about Russia than anybody who was not Russian, and his value, um, mostly after the war, um, was incredible in the uh, for the Cold War. So he was an incredibly valuable uh, person there as well. Um, there were some, and I just just let me shift gears here a little bit. There were some who came through uh, early on. There were some who came through U-boats who made it very clear that they didn't like what was going on in Germany, and they would be very, very happy to serve as stool pigeons, that was a term that they used, and, and bunk with German prisoners to try to get information from them or get them to talk about things that were going on. And there were quite a few who were, who were in that program as well. So if you add together all the different people who were there, um, the generals, uh, the people after the war, during the war, uh, it was there, and most of the most of the information was like little tidbits here and there. Um, but uh, when you add all of it together, it was incredibly valuable. Let's listen to the voice of another one of the interrogators. This is George Frankel. We went on uh, maneuvers in North uh, Louisiana, and there I was grabbed uh, without any previous knowledge on my part, and was transferred to. Fort uh, Bull, to POB 1142. And there I was placed in charge of a contingent of enlisted men who uh, transcribed, monitored interrogation, uh, interrogations of naval personnel. Robert Sutton, one of the things that you reported uh, from these interrogations is that the Germans were terrified of being turned over to the Russians. Why? <laughs> this is, I think this is one of the, one of the really fascinating stories. Um, I mentioned earlier what they mentioned was that um, generally the, the prisoners were fairly forthcoming with information. Um, if they weren't, they had several, t but they never beat them. That, they wanted to make it very, very clear that that was that they did not beat prisoners. But they wanted to make it, they, they wanted to make it very clear that they wanted information. And so one of the first techniques they used was to take them down to the bunkers from the 1900 um, Fort Hunt. They'd lock them in the bunkers for a day or so. Never over, they said never overnight, but for a day, bring them back. Sometimes that would soften up the prisoners. But the thing that worked better than anything else was for them to uh, if someone was reluctant to say anything, there were two uh, Russian-American soldiers who were at Fort Hunt, Alexander Shedlinsky and Alexander Dallin. They were dressed in Red Army uniforms. They were, they were conspicuous throughout the fort. If, some, if uh, an interrogator thought that, that someone was being cagey and not forthcoming with the information, they would call in one of these two fellows, and they'd say, Oh, you don't want to talk to us? How about if Ivan here takes you to the Soviet Union? Maybe they would like to hear what you have to say. That worked incredibly well, both at, um, at Fort Hunt and in Europe. And uh, one of the fellows who uh, did interrogations primarily in Europe said that, and this is, I think, fairly well, fairly well substantiated, that about 80% of soldiers who were reluctant to talk would talk if the threat was to, if they didn't talk, take them to the Soviet Union. Mamie Eisenhower has a cameo role in your book. Tell me that story. <laughs> this, is, this is a great story. Uh, one, of the, one of the men who's, who actually is still alive, I've talked to him, uh, his name is Arno Mayer. He's a former retired professor at Princeton, history professor at Princeton. And he and one of his friends, and they'd been together actually, um, they were at Camp Ritchie. They came to Fort Hunt together. And this was after the war. This is in 1946. They were at Fort Hunt. And um, Arno Mayer had, a, had, a, um, had lined up two dates in New York. He was from New York and lined up two women for them to date. They had to get to New York, and they had to go catch a train. So they'd missed the, the – there was a bus that, that sometimes was, would run. They really weren't supposed to hitchhike, but they went out on the GW Parkway. It was pouring rain. Uh, 
And the first car that came by picked them up. There were three women in the car. One of them got in the front seat, so they were sitting in the back seat, and they, they talked back and forth. The women said they didn't know how far they could take them, but they really liked these two boys, so they took them all the way to Union Station. When they got on the train, uh, Leslie Wilson, uh, who was, uh, Leslie Wilson said to Arno Mayer, he said, did you hear the women calling, the woman sitting in the middle, Mamie? Yes. Did you also hear that her husband was General Eisenhower? Yes. Well, do you know what General Eisenhower's wife's name is? No. So they checked and found out that, yes, indeed, Mamie was General Eisenhower's wife. They decided that it would be really nice to write a thank you note to her in care of her husband, who at the time was now the uh, chief of staff um, in the Pentagon. They wrote a letter to General Eisenhower, care of the Pentagon, thanking uh, Mamie Eisenhower for giving them a ride. So, um, a few days later, they're called into the commanding officer's office at Fort Hunt, and they're terrified. They don't know why they're being called in. They knew that they had hitchhiked. That was pro- they weren't really supposed to do that. Maybe that was a problem. They'd written a letter to Mamie Eisenhower. That really could be a big problem. But as they walked into the office, they said that the commanding officer almost was bowing to them. They said, whoa, what's going on here? So he handed them a letter. The letter was from General Eisenhower, and in the letter, it said, Dear uh, Sergeants uh, Mayer and uh, Wilson, uh, Mrs. Eisenhower wants, was not feeling well, and she's been very busy. She asked me to write you a letter, and thank you for thanking her for giving you, for giving you a ride um, to the station. He went on and on. He said, you know, we love to pick up, we love to pick up you young soldiers uh, because we like you, and we always learn something from you, signed Dwight David Eisenhower. Now, um, both these men, one kept the letter, one kept the envelope, and fortunately for us, they donated both uh, to the National Park Service, and we have them in our collection. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. You earlier had mentioned two other operations that went on at Fort Hunt. One was called the Creamery, and the other was the Warehouse. I wanted to go back to that story about the Creamery and the coding system with American POWs held in German camps. Uh, you had described it as being able to send encrypted messages and uh, also hide things in things like cribbage boards. It seems so elementary. I mean, that how were they able to get these things past the Germans? Well, what they would do is they would... Now, the, the, the person that, that set up the crypt, cryptographic system, his name was Silvio Bedini, and actually he became very, very famous later as uh, uh, at the uh, Smithsonian, at the new... Um, what is now the American History Museum at the Smithsonian. We were able to catch him actually not long before he passed away. Um, he actually was bedridden when we, when we captured him. But what he did was he set up this crypt- cryptology um, system. And the way it worked was he would have soldiers who were, who were not very, very educated write the letters. And this is, this is something I found very, very fascinating um, he said, "You can't. You can. You can teach people to improve their writing, but what you can't do is take someone who's a very good writer and have them write something that's not very good." So, he tried to make make all of the letters that were sent from Fort Hunt um, not be the best in in style or or grammar or so forth. But in these letters would be would be a message that um, would be important. And letters, you, if the Germans re- read the letters, they would have no idea what any of this meant. But they would come in. Uh, there was somebody at every fort, at every uh, POW camp, um, maybe two or three, who knew what this cryptology, uh, cryptographic message system was. They could they could read the the uh, letters. They knew what was coming. So there'd be, a letter would say there's a package coming from such and such um, organization. Be on the lookout for it. So what they would do is they would do everything they could to keep an eye on all the packages that were coming in and do whatever they could to try to make sure that the Germans didn't see what was in these packages um, before they could could actually get them and use them. 
And as you said, there was there were things that were hidden in the packages. Um, they sometimes they got a little bit more bold as the war went on, but um, it just was a, just an amazing story. Now, in reality, not very many Americans were able to escape from German POW camps. Um, not very many. I think it's seven hundred and something were able to escape um, from these camps because most of them were in far, far eastern Europe, so it was very difficult. But mostly what it did, what is, it improved their morale. So, like, they would know from the, with these um, transmitters and these uh, radios that were sent to them, they could, they could monitor the BBC, for example, and there were encrypted messages in the BBC, or they would get something saying, you know, uh, uh, hang in there, uh, from General Eisenhower, hang in there, we're almost, we're almost done. And they could follow what was going on in the war as well. So mostly it was to improve morale. Uh, the other thing you referenced, <clears throat> we have about seven minutes left in our conversation, was something called Operation Paperclip. Could you tell me more about that? Yes. Um, after the war, the um, Americans were very anxious to get the top-level Germans, primarily Germans, um, who had expertise that they thought would be valuable um, uh, th- to have them come and stay in the United States and help planning for the um, for the Cold War. <clears throat> so there were some areas that were that were like like gold almost the the rocket program the German rocket program was uh, was very important and so Werner von Braun um, came to the United States um, with his team most of the, the rocket engineers. Uh, came with him. Now, there's no evidence that he personally was at Fort Hunt. He might have been. We just don't know that. He came through um, uh, Fort Strong uh, in Boston Harbor and then pretty soon thereafter went out to uh, El Paso to um, Fort Bliss. But uh, that was a very important part. Uh, one of the one of the most, I think, one of the most interesting people who came through this program was a ma- man by the name of Hans Schichte. And what he, he came on, a, there was a submarine, a German submarine, the U-234. At the end of the war, the Germans took everything out of the submarine, loaded it with everything they possibly could, including jet airplane, a disassembled jet airplane, um, mercury, uranium, uh, the newest technology in weapons and so forth. And they sent, the plan was to send this U-boat to Japan to help the Japanese fight the war. And uh, right at the end of the war, um, the, the war ended, and the, uh, this, the commander of the U-boat surrendered to the Americans. The U-boat was taken to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and most of the, most of the men on board were, were brought to Fort Hunt. And one of them was this man, Hans Schichte, who was a specialist in microwave technology. And he was a, one, of the, one of the top engineers in Germany. So with the war ending, there all of a sudden was a desire to have him stay in the United States. And so uh, they wanted to encourage him to stay in the United States. But the problem was his family was uh, in Germany and actually was now in the Russian sector of Germany. So they they had to get his family to the United States so that he would stay. And he turned out to be one of the most successful. Um, He actually ended up in, in Milwaukee and became one of the most important parts of this of the Cold War period. So he, that's just one example. But there were um, about several, uh, several hundred that came here with all kinds of expertise. And it was controversial, or now is controversial, because some of them were pretty not very good people. Like I mentioned uh, Reinhard um, Galen earlier. He was a pretty awful person, um, but he was very important. Uh, bon, bon Braun, Werner Von Braun, um, was considered... The, the father of American rocketry, but later they found out, Americans found out, uh, that he had been a member of the Nazi party, he'd been a, an officer in the SS, as well as being the des- rocket designer. So there was some controversy with it, but the Americans felt that this was such an important program, they needed to get the top people they could um, for this program. After the, the uh, war, after the Germans surrendered, how uh, long did it take for the unit at Fort Hunt to be disbanded? About a year. 
about a year. And how long did it take for all of the buildings and everything there to come down? Well, uh, the when when the war was over, uh, that's this is this is an interesting little side story. Um, before the war, Fort Hunt had been turned over to the National Park Service, and it had been a, a major. Um, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps camp, and so the arrangement, uh, the the arrangement between the the Department of War and Department of Interior, was that the it would still belong to the National Park Service, but a year after the war was over, it would be returned to the National Park Service, and uh, the War Department would remove all the buildings that it had built before the war. So it took down a lot of the buildings, and then, not long after. Uh, the Park Service started dismantling what what was left of the other buildings. Some were reused. Um, there's a uh, one of the soldiers who was at Fort Hunt. His name was uh, Rudy Pins. Took I mentioned Gustav Hilger. Um, he he wanted to see the site where he had been, and so he took him out to Fort Hunt. And at this time, it was probably in the 1950s. Um, the hut that he had stayed in was still there, being used as a restroom. So over time. Almost all the facilities at Fort Hunt were demolished uh, to make way for this, what is now the primarily recreation park. You have detailed the uh, contributions that the information gathered by the interrogators at Fort Hunt made to the war effort, World War II. But you also wrote, archivists suggest that the vast amount of information gathered at Fort Fort Hunt was valuable to our understanding of war and how warfare affects soldiers in modern conflicts like Iraq and Afghanistan. As we close, could you comment on that? Yes, um, there was, you know, the, the volume of information that was gathered at Fort Hunt is enormous. Uh, I can't even imagine how many forests were lost <laughs> with the paper that was gathered. And um, a German, um, German scholar... Um, unfortunately, I'm forgetting his name at the moment. Um, they they actually started looking at the at these interrogations not so much for the information that um, came through the interrogations, but for how soldiers were reacting to things. So, in other words, were they how were they reacting when they talked about death? Um, was it like, okay, so and so died, and you know it was too bad? Or was it something that really affected them? Was it something that that uh, would have an, a, an, a profound influence on them? And so they started looking at these at these documents not so much for the information that had been gathered about World War II because that was long gone, but they found that um, there was they they could really sort of get sort of get into the heads of prisoners who were opening up and telling a lot of things that uh, were not really important at Fort Hunt for, the, for winning World War II, but became important later on for understanding how soldiers react to war. And, you know, there, there are a lot of things that have been written. Um, I didn't refer to um, some of the things that have been written more recently, but now we understand a lot more things like uh, post-traumatic uh, P- PTSD. Uh, we understand that a lot better. Uh, and so the the documents that we have from the interrogations, I think now are are really valuable for understanding a lot of things like uh, how how war affects people and how war affects um, individuals, and in this case, how it war affected the Germans. The book is called Nazis on the Potomac, the top secret intelligence operation that helped win World War II. Robert Sutton, historian and author of the book, thank you so much for spending an hour with C-SPAN. You're very welcome, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 